All right, I think we can start with a uh, pleasure to have Nokia Polisi for Flory here today and we'll talk about the telephone key and its implementation. So I'm not going to speak about really complicated stuff, I mean from a mathematical point of view, but about how credits are implemented in stage, uh, about the performance and yeah, the basic functionalities and how you deal with precision and how you represent in exact elements. So I'll start with talking about what is in Sage you now and what should be in the future in Sage. But also about what is in Flint, Mathematic and Paui, which are I mean other software used or not used by Sage. And then I'm show you some benchmarks about the speed in these different systems. Uh, when I manage to benchmark anything. And in the end, a little bit of about precision and how you can, you will be able to deal with that in the near future, I guess. Um, so I didn't really do anything about all of this. It's mostly work by other people. Uh, for Sage, I don't really know. I think it might be some of the people here. Uh, for Flint, it's mostly work by Sebastian Pankos, which used to be a PhD student here. Uh, Mathematic, it's people from the Code Polytechnic and some of the institutions. So, PowerGP is developed in Bordeaux, and the work on precision is mostly by David Wall and Xavier Caruso. So, what do we have in stage now? So, to represent a PIDX number, you need an infinite amount of memory or anything, and you have to, to wait for the, a lot of time before the computer can provide that, so you have to represent them with uh, approximations, and you have to decide of some way to deal with precision and uh, how you truncate them and so on. And in Sage, you can currently use periodic integers and numbers and periodic fields. You can also define a ramified and Eisenstein extension. And there is currently some work done by Julian Root to represent general extensions, so using a ramified and Eisenstein extension because it should be enough to deal with general things. So we have a look at how periodic integers and numbers are represented in Sage. We have three ways to deal with the precision. Um, the simplest one is what is called fixed modulus. So basically, um, you're playing with elements in z over p to the n <coughs> mod, uh, mod p to the n z. And you don't really deal with precision, you just are working with modular integers, except you have specific algorithms. So it's not really, I mean, it's useful because it's faster, and that's basically what you want to use if you want to do some iteration or emphasis things. But maybe not the best way to deal with mathematical properties. So the next thing you have is what is called cap absolute. So you define a, a common precision for all your all of the common maximum precision for all of your elements, but each element tracks its own precision, so which is limited by the common precision. Um, so in this case you also represent your periodic integers using a basic integer style. And the last way to represent um, PIDX integers is using what's called cap relative. So it's working both for uh, elements of the PIDX ring and PIDX fields. And basically, you, you have some bounded amount of precision between your valuation and uh, so for your, the unit part. In the case of absolute precision, it only works for integral elements. So you 
are basically doing the same thing as for fixed modulus. So you just truncate everything <coughs> mod p to the, to the n. Uh, and in the relative case, you just truncate the unit part mod p to the n. Um, so in all of these representations, the Dix numbers are represented using the integers for the unit part, <coughs> basically, and some way to track the, the precision. So either it's uh, some common thing between all the, the elements of the ring, or each element tracks its own precision. But you can represent the Dix numbers uh, in other ways. So in particular, you can use something like four series, where you just uh, um, write something like a times plus b times p plus, plus c times p to the 2 and so on. Um, and can be interesting uh, because you cannot directly use fast arithmetic for integers, um, but you can use what we call lazy PLX where you just um, compute the coefficients of your policy series when you need them and you don't do everything at once for every operation. Um, and in particular, it's what's been being implemented in mathematics with where you have so-called relaxed algorithm, which is something <coughs> like in between lazy periodics, which are lazy, and usual or zero algorithm. So you have something lazy but fast. So it becomes relaxed. Um, and another current limitation is when you have some periodic objects, or maybe not an integer, but some polynomial or, or matrix, you mm -hmm. just have one precision for all of the objects. So if you have some polynomial, every coefficient will be reduced to the same precision. So this problem and the other one as well, uh, I mean, about implementation of lazy PLX is being addressed by Xavier Caruso from Moran and David Wall, which works I don't know where, I can tell you. So um, I just stop their work and do a little bit of demo in the end when I will be speaking about precision in, in more detail. So, so a quick, quick question about yeah. that. Um, if I create a polynomial ring mm -hmm. over a periodic ring, mm -hmm. are you saying that it has a specialized constructor that gives you polynomials with a global precision? Is there a way to force it to just write down like generic polynomials with entries that happen to be periodics, each with their own precision? I don't really remember, so we can just try. Mm. <coughs> implementation is a cat relative because you can do the fraction field of that, which is nice. Okay. And now I want to create something on the line. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe it's each coefficient tracking its own precision. I don't know. So is that that's on the constant term, is it? Yep. No. So in fact, I, I, I guess it's not what I said. So. Okay. You, you have a vector of precision. But uh, after Xavier's and David's work, you can do more complicated stuff. You can use Newton polygons and things like that. Mm -hmm. oh, I guess you can also decide to have just one minimal valuation and, and use that. So doing what I was saying, but which is not the case. No? Right. So as I said, from a, an implementation point of view, um, all of these types, or at least for Felix numbers, are represented using uh, multi-precision integers, which is currently using GMP or MPIR. So some MPZ, 
mm, to represent the or either the unit part or the all integers of mod p to the n in the first case. Um, so for the fixed modulus, you just have one integer representing your periodic number mod p to the n, and in both the other case, um, in the second one, you also have that plus some precision tracking using some maybe long integers or something like that. And in the last case, for the relative precision tracking, you also have some integer, um, single precision integers to track the precision and some MPZ to, mm, to represent the unit part. And currently, Felix numbers, uh, I mean, unramified and Eisenstein extensions of the PLX are represented using uh, MTLs polynomials. And the precision tracking is done in a similar way as for PLX numbers. So you let's have a couple of <coughs> integers on something like that for each position. So why is it using MTLs polynomials? The MTL has, has this, uh, specialized classes for polynomials. Well, actually, yeah, it's a, mm, the uh, underscore PX. So it's polynomial with coefficients modulo p to the something. It's not polynomial over the integers. It's polynomial with modular coefficients. Yeah, for for uh, for so periodic means unramified. Unramified, basically. Right. Oh, that is the only thing I use. So. Yeah, but the the I mean uh, NTL has has a class for polynomials over z mod p to the n more than other polynomial, right? So mm -hmm. also all the more, all the uh, uh, I'm not sure should be done more efficiently. Yeah. Okay. So I had a look at the sources and I, I don't think it was used, but maybe I, I am wrong. So we can just check. It seems it's only using something like that. Oh, you got something like VPXC. So maybe is it what you're thinking about? <coughs> well, I have a recollection oh. that there's some sort of, sort of an E thing there. Yeah, there is. Something <coughs> you could use ZZPE, which is polynomials modulo, some modulus. You said you were talking about the, the PEX, which is polynomials yeah. over those things. Yeah, no, no, but what I meant is the PE. Right? Oh, right. That's, right. that's the one that should correspond to the QIs, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, you could use that. If it's not the case, I guess it would be a nice project. Um, especially now that uh, David Wall and Julian Ruth uh, developed some templating for PLX classes in Sage. So it's now quite easy to offer different implementation of the same objects. So right now it's not easy because you have to take that file and mix it somehow. But when the ticket is merged, it should be you just have to copy the file, modify it, and you have both, right? For free. Okay. So what can you do with PLX numbers? Um, kind of whatever you want. So we've seen you can create them, which is nice. You can define polynomials, you can add them. Um, so the, the exact behavior depends on the way you deal with precision. So let's create a wing with fixed modulus, which basically create. Uh, maybe it's too small. 
No? Okay. So you choose the type of precision by passing the type argument here. So this one is fixed precision. So I can create some random element. Another one. Them, and multiply them. So in this case, uh, multiplication can make no sense. So B is a unit, so we can divide by it without problem. But if I want to divide by something which is not a unit, as I'm dealing with element in Z over uh, P to the N Z, it won't be working and Sage will complain. But I can force it to do it anyway. And in this case, what Sage does, he is just discarding everything with every coefficients with uh, negative valuation. So for that implementation, but if you use something maybe with more mathematical sense, so let's say the cat relative implementation, No, you actually have division with anything. So you see that the result has some coefficients with negative valuation, and that now the, the big of O of 5 to the something lost to uh, two digits of, of precision yeah. because we just shifted everything. You can also do um, maybe more complicated stuff. Like, oops. Computing the exponential of something. Okay. Logarithm. I'm sure you have uh, more applications for these numbers than I do um, because I'm basically interested in point counting of our elliptic curves. So what you need is quite simple and you mostly want something very fast. So I'll come back about that a little bit later. So we can also create an ramified extension. So you do that using the few P constructor or the, the DQ. So you have to do something like maybe mm, okay. you need a, a name for the indeterminate and this should be working. extension of degree 3 and I can, I can do a bunch of <coughs> arithmetic with elements to the world. <coughs> Should be able to complete norms and I don't know the trade and so on. And then it's Frobenius which is kind of slow even if in this example because everything is small. Um, and as I said, you can also do identifying extension. Um, can, I, can I just ask a question about this unramified extension? I, I was trying to use this a while ago and I had this problem that it was not easy to, to move between um, the, the attic field and the 
residue field. Mm -hmm. So reducing mod P and then just coming up with arbitrary lips, I thought that should be a matter of just straightforward coercion, and I just couldn't get it to work. And I had to like write my own yeah, stuff. You mean for elements of the extension? Or of this, yeah, mm -hmm. but no, yeah, no, yeah, it's extension. possible, because I also wanted to use it, and there were some sex faults when you inverted <laughs> stuff and so on. So I ended up using Flynn instead, <laughs> which is not such a bad thing. But I, I think at least the sex faults I was uh, mm. encountering is fixed now. Okay, I didn't get sex faults, but it just it just didn't yeah. work. I, I that would be sure it's implemented in fact. That would be oh number yeah, one on my list. So you wanted to do something like this, right? Okay. So you wanted to take some elements of the yeah, I and reduce it mod p. Yep, and then I want to be able to go the other way. So given a given an element mm -hmm. of the residue field, I want an arbitrary lift. Yeah, so that's really frustrating. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> that should work. So you have a nice project for the week? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't have with really you. Mm -hmm. But if you're working with, yeah. And base wing, I think it's okay. Well, it's quite simple. You just have to take everything with P, so it's not so complicated. Well, I mean, right. the other one is not so complicated as <laughs> Anyway, um, so you can also do Eisenstein extension. So I don't really play with ramified stuff usually, so I think I'll be needing some help to pick a, a good polynomial. Um, so let's create a, a field first. Okay. Which polynomial do you prefer to do? Something of degree 3, which will define the Eisenstein extension? I can shift otherwise. Yeah, it's degree 5, but it's fine with me. I know you can just do something like you need a name for the uniformizer. And Stuff. Now you have PLX and PLX numbers, like, I don't know, creating an elliptic curve of a part. And do, I guess, a lot of things. So, what are people actually doing now about this code? So, there, there has been a big work by David Wu and Julian Wu about refactoring the the code of the PLX numbers um, <coughs> in order uh, that it uses something similar to what is done for polynomials. So you have some kind of templating where you just have to take some skeleton of files and fill it with implementation details. So how do you call the C library and things like that. And it's really nice because, as I said, now you can have Several, several implementations of the PLX numbers using different libraries living together in a really easy way. And I think yeah, it's also much easier to man maintain because you really have a list of functions you have to implement and for each C library you want to use, you, you do it in a different way, but for the user it's exactly the same. I mean, from the Python level, you doesn't change anything. Um, so this is currently on on track and it is actually positively reviewed and it should make its way into sage uh, six dot something. 
In fact, I tried to use the branch yesterday and it doesn't really work anymore. So it doesn't compile. So actually we can just try, I guess. I'm using the git workflow. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. I think I did it because it was not working, but maybe it's hidden somewhere. So I, I don't really have a local branch, but as I'm fetching all of the track branches every time, it must be somewhere here. Yeah. Okay, so I just told Git to kind of change the status of the directory to reflect what's in this branch. Um, uh, I can try to compile while I speak and it should fail. So another development is what uh, Xavier and David are doing about precision and they have some code on the, the web page of uh, the setup project which stands for something like Calcul Effectif en Théorie de Hodge Pédic. So, effective computation in PID coach theory. Um, it's also kind of broken, but much less broken because it's based on some older version of Sage. And I managed to compile it yesterday, so you have a demo in the end. And the last point I want to mention is that. Uh, Julian Roos is working on general extensions of PDX numbers, so based on the implementation of Eisenstein extension and unified extension. But it's I don't think there's any code available yet. So maybe if you ask him. So now let's go to Flint and its implementation of PDX. So Flint is a C library for doing number theory. Uh, it's based on GMT mostly MPIR, but now it also supports GMP back. Uh, MPIR for floating point uh, calculation, or calculation with floating point numbers. And you also have some routine for conventions from and to MPL. So it was first developed by Lipa, David Harvey, and mm -hmm, another team. Uh, for the first version, and in 2K11, uh, Bill Hart and Frederick Johansson and Sebastian Pankos completely reworked Flint uh, and gave birth to Flint 2. So nowadays it's about 100,000 lines of C code. So this is surely including uh, blank lines and comments, but anyway. Uh, it's been staged since a lot of time, so I mean the first version of Flint I don't really know because I was not there, but was developed kind of for Sage to have fast arithmetic. And since the end of 2K11, uh, Martin Lee has also been developing some wrapper to use Flint within Singular. There is a track ticket to switch on that support in the Singular version that Sage ships, but it's not, uh, I don't think it's reviewed at all. So you can have a look at ticket number 13, 3, 31. What was the reason for complete rewrite? I don't know. You should ask David, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was I, there. I don't really want to know <laughs> either. <laughs> uh, I, I think that it, all, all the code that I had written was crap and he wanted to throw it out and start again. I, I don't know. I have no idea. I left, I left before it happened. No, the code is quite credible. I, I don't know how it was before, but no, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so what about PIDX? Uh, so Sebastian Pankratz has been developing a, a PIDX module and as well as mm, polynomials over this and matrices and 
unramified extension. So Puradic is only unramified in its range right now. Um, it's been integrated to, well, at least the Puradic module has been integrated into version 2.2, which was released two years ago. Um, it's still in version 2.3, and all the other modules should make it into version 2.4, which releases Flaky maybe before the end of the year, <coughs> I don't know. Um, so the peer doc, um, I mean for all of these four modules, the code is about 10,000 lines, so it's maybe 10% of all of the things. And since, so the last official version, which was 2.3, which was released uh, this year, maybe last year, I'd say last year, um, there's been a small change uh, for the PIDIC implementation, but even though it's small, it's un no, the implementation uh, of version 2.3 and 2.4 are incompatible, so you shouldn't really write anything based on version 2.3 because it won't be working anymore with the later versions. But if you really want to write something, you can just use the uh, a git version of Flint and it should be okay. Um, so what could we do with um, those implementation for search? Um, with a nice template interface, we could implement, uh, oh no, okay. So in fact, um, I think you run rules already implemented and ramified extensions of PRDX using Flint, but it's not using the PRDX modules or the PRDX module from uh, from Flint. It's using uh, the yeah the FMPZ mod poly module, which is basically just uh, polynomial with uh, coefficients module or something. So it's kind of the same thing as the NTL class which is currently used. Uh, but as you pointed out, we also have some class which is kind of like the ZPXE NTL equivalent, so we should try to do that rather than this class. But anyway, um, there is a ticket for that implementation, so it's kind of ready for use. Uh, I didn't try to compile it because I had enough trouble yesterday. But you can try it. So it's uh, on on try, but there's also some git branch to try it. Uh, even though we implement something using the QADIC module from Flint, it would be nice to have both implementations. Mm. So there's also some other nice application of, of this code. So the first one is uh, point counting on hypersurfaces using deformation theory, which was developed by Sebastian and Jan, I guess, or at least the theory. Um, it's available on Sebastian GitHub account, mm, so you can just download it and do a lot of stuff. Uh, I also coded some point counting on elliptic curves in characteristic 2 uh, using canonical lift method, which is really fast. Uh, much faster than what Magma does. Um, but at some point, the guide from Perry GP also did it, and it's even faster. Uh, I guess the main reason is that in Perry GP, you have uh, specialized implementation for everything in characteristic 2, which Flynn doesn't have, yeah, so which I don't have. And yeah, it really makes a difference. Uh, I didn't try for people, so I don't know. Um, so my code is not completely av available yet because it's too dirty, but at least one thing which is available is some implementation of the QADIC, but not using sparse polynomials for the modulus, but I I'll be speaking about that later. And the real big problem is that both these applications are based on version 2.3, so what means they won't be working anymore with the next release of things. We have to do some rebasing. It's not complicated, but it's more. Um, so, all of the numbers <coughs> are implemented in Flint. So, it's basically the same thing as in Sage. So, you have yeah, 
of course, uh, the main philosophy is that when you compute something, you make as if your input are exact, you compute the result with exactly, so I say using integers, and only in the end you truncate it to the precision you want. So it's kind of the same thing as MPFR does for real numbers. So you, you said this is the same as what Sage does, but this is not really what Sage does. Sage digs it out automatically for you, whereas here you're choosing a target precision yeah. on each operation. Yeah. So it, it is like MPFR. This one? Yeah, that's what you just said. Yeah, yeah. in fact with each element you have some precision within the element. So when you compute I don't know A which has precision something, times B which has precision something, and you want to put it put the product in something else, you have to specify the precision in the last element yeah. and it will trunk it there. Right. Okay. So you, you don't have anything global anymore. In fact in Flint 2.3 you used to have something and you don't have it anymore. So that that's a big change which breaks everything. Because all the functions change oh, the signature and all right, so you don't so you don't store the you do or you do not store the precision with the element? Yeah, you do not. You do now, and it didn't before that. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, you don't really have precision tracking now because you have to specify it when you which with each element, but I mean from some higher level it should be kind of easy to implement whatever you want. <coughs> so <coughs> from a low low level uh, point of view, so you basically just do like page. So you have something for the unit part, which is not uh, an MPVT but some thin type that's MPV. Uh, something for the Evaluation. So before 2.3 it was all you had, but now you also have to store the precision within each element. So you have the unit part, V for the evaluation, and N for the precision of the element. Mm. You also have to know somehow in which char characteristic you're working. So you have this context object which could be kind of the equivalent of parent in stage, the kind of. So before 2.3 you not only store the characteristic but the precision as well and some additional data so I guess it's a low precision inverse and some powers of the characteristic and something about printing the element. But after 2.3, you don't have the precision anymore in the context because it's stored within each element. So it was also considered to use different implementations. So what you could do is something like power series, but instead of using base p, you could use base p to the k which could be nice to avoid really costly modular uh, reductions but which is really nice now is that you just have something for any P and it always works and it's kind of easy to maintain Do, do the elements, are they always stored in a canonical interval? Are they always reduced? In a what? So your elements, are they always reduced mod P to the N? Yeah. I mean, not within the algorithms which are in clean, but when you get the output, it's reduced. It's kind of funny because we see something uh, during the benchmarks, and Sage doesn't always do that. So I thought it was faster, but it was because there was no reduction in the end. Um, <coughs> so I guess you can do kind of whatever you want with PDX numbers in clean. Um, I mean ba basic arithmetic, so you have yeah. addition, multiplication, division, square roots, and so on. So, mm, I think Sebastian really worked a lot on all of them and put a lot of small tricks uh, in each algorithm. So for addition, you use a usual trick. 
So you don't always do some modular reduction, but you just do the addition. You check that uh, the result is not bigger than your precision bound or than p to the n. Uh, if it's bigger, you just do one subtraction, which is much cheaper than doing some modular reduction. Um, yeah, so you have some function for multiplication, which is not a big surprise. Um, so inversion is, is done using uh, instant lifting. Uh, yeah, I could expect it. You've got uh, a square root as well, which is done um, using the usual tricks. So in fact, you're doing some instant <coughs> lifting for the inverse square root, and in the last step, you combine the lifting for the inverse square root and for the inversion. So you end up with the square root, and which basically saves you one multiplication. Because if you do it in a naive way, you, you will be computing the inverse square root, and then do some multiplication at full precision to, to get what you really want. Um, we can also compute the Schmuller representatives and it's done in a smart way so that you don't have to do any inversions, which is nice because inversion is already is all the way so expensive. Um, you have uh, exponentials. Um, exponential, not exponentiation. Um, so what the function does, it first tells you oh, it you can put anywhere into it and it will tell you if the series doesn't converge. And if it does, it will compute it uh, using the, the truncated for a series. And it's done in a smart way. So you just have to do one inversion. So you multiply everything by the common denominators of the series term and then do one inversion in the end. And there are two algorithms to implemented. So the first one is what is called rectangular splitting. So you just take your series and chop it into chunks of the same size. So in fact for each chunk you just you will just have one inversion and then sum them together. And what is called balance splitting. So uh, the less precision you need, the larger the chunk will be. So you just start with more chunk because you will need high precision and when you go on with evaluating the chunks of the series you take larger and larger chunks or the other way around so you just move with the precision the, the size of the chunks and, and in fact both when you just call the exponential function uh, it automatically chooses which one is the best so you have some threshold where I guess balance splitting becomes more efficient than rectangular splitting. So you have the same thing for um, the logarithm, and you also have uh, an algorithm using ideas of Sato, Shionda, uh, and Tabushi, I think. Um, where before computing the logarithm, you want to take your argument and put it uh, to the something so that the valuation is higher and the, the series uh, converges more quickly and then you do some uh, division in the end to get what you want. Okay, so as I said you can also have uh, polynomials over periodic. Mm which are represented in this way. So you have some uh, v for the valuation, and you want at least one of the coefficients to be a unit. And you have all you could expect for such things, so basic arithmetic, uh, composition of polynomials, evaluation, and so on. And finally, you Using, oh, it's not really using this, but kind of. Um, you have uh, unmodified extensions of PLX numbers. So there is one, I mean, it's not really a limitation, but 
currently you can only use uh, for polynomials something with small coefficients and something sparse. Mm. Uh, why is that? It's because uh, the reduction modu modulo f is done in a naive way, which is really fast if f has small coefficients and if it has a really few coefficients non-zero. But it's not really practical when you want things like fast Frobenius uh, computations and so on. So basically, it's what I needed for my point counting. So what I did is to modify this module to implement fast uh, modular reduction. So you can have fast Frobenius substitution. Of course, the reduction is slower than the really naive one when with a sparse polynomial, but it's a trade-off. And, and once more, you have kind of everything you, you could expect, mm. even square root, which is not written here. So, yeah, basically, the, the algorithm are, are implementing implemented using the same ideas. So one little difference is, is that now for the exponential, you, you don't just do one version, but you do it at each step, which should be, I'd say, the naive way, but it's more efficient in this case, and so on. So you also have algorithm. You can compute for Venus substitution. So it's, um, in fact, you can ask for any power of it. So it's done using instead lifting for um, your generator and then some uh, polynomial composition. And in fact, it's done in a really, really smart way because what Sebastian does it is that he's computing uh, so the Frobenius substitution for x, but also some power of x, so that, or I mean x to x to the i. And then it does some kind of rectangular splitting, so it computes chunks of everything, which is a, a I'd say, a time memory trade-off, which is which is quite useful. Mm. Yeah, so you can compute the trace using the usual formula. So you compute it for uh, your basis, and then you kind of have it for every element. And you have two impl implementation of the norm. So one using uh, an analytical formula, so using lo logarithm and exponentials, and uh, another one using uh, resultants of polynomials, which should be So, what should be developed for things? So, what is kind of done is to have code specific for finite fields, which you can see as Kelic numbers, but with precision one. Um, I think it has been, has been done by some students last year during the Google Summer of Code, but it's not merged yet. It should be for 2.4, but I'm not sure it would be. Uh, what would be really nice is, is to have a fast implementation for other kind of modulus when you want to represent uh, unramified extensions. Uh, so I've done it, but I have to rewrite my code. Uh, I guess you would also want other type of extensions, so at least Eisenstein and then general ones. Um, it would be really nice to have specific implementations for P equals 2, because the arithmetic really becomes different and can be much faster. And finally, uh, we should try to wrap something using the periodic mo module into Sage, using the template interface. Okay, so now let's go to mathematics. Uh, so it's another computer algebra system uh, developed in C++. Uh, so, the main also, actually the one mm, mentioned on the main page of the project. I go it from the Hosen, the Degoire Essay and the Honor One. Um, and some other guy like Jean Bertomieu and 
So it's, uh, I don't know how many lines of code it is because I tried to close the subversion repository yesterday, but it was too slow, it never finished. But at least what we want to ship at first into Sage, um, so it's three modules, which are called basics, which is for, I don't know, basic stuff, numerics, which is kind of integers and modular arithmetic, and algebra mix, where you can get power series and cubic numbers, and this is about yeah, 1,000, uh, 100,000 lines of code. Um, so during the last Sage days, uh, we developed some experimental worker, and uh, I give you some demo in a, in a moment. I guess I should find it. Okay, so that was the template uh, branch, so it didn't work. Probably not that hard to fix, but so I guess the, the main goal in mathematics was to implement a relaxed algorithm, so basically lazy PIDs with asymptotically. I really don't know how to say that. Synthetically fast algorithm. Um, so PIDX are represented uh, as power series. Uh, yeah, even uh, at if at some point you can group the terms together and you get something in between the usual model using integers, multiplication integers, and power series. And you have a lot of different implementation and different algorithms to deal with your elements and as it is C++, uh, most of the choices you can make are, do, are done by specializing uh, some templates. Um, so the main advantages of such implementations uh, over the usual or zeroth implementations uh, is that you can just increase the precision of your elements as you need. You don't even have to double it each time, which is what you would do with Encel or Newton iterations. And it can be quite uh, efficient to solve what they call recursive equations, um, which you can also solve using uh, Newton and Encel Newton, but which avoids you to compute the inverse of some big, potentially big uh, Jacobian matrix. Um, so as I said, we developed a minimalistic wrapper. Uh, but the real problem is that, yeah, Mathematics uses a lot of C++ features that Cyton does not really support, like templated functions. So Cyton supports templated classes. Uh, which Mathematic also use, but it doesn't support templated functions. So things outside of classes also using templates. And the, the code, I mean, all code is kind of bugged, as you will see. So yesterday I wanted to do some benchmark with that. So yeah, it's really minimalistic and ugly dot, <coughs> so it's called MMX PIDX something right now, so I can import that, and I can define some elements, so let's say three in the PIDX with characteristic 17, so yeah, it works, I can compute A plus A, yeah, it seems to work, I can compute I cannot compute minus A right now, but I can do something like 0 minus A. Seems to work. Um, so by default, I think it only computes. Increment correlation because otherwise, the order is minus there is only. Yeah, yeah, but it's really minimal, so yeah. uh, it, it doesn't inherit from anything. Um, so I said, okay, it's great. So I wanted, yeah, you can also, it's not really interesting. Um, 
So you can compute A to the something B. So you can access some higher precision digits. So let's say it's uh, 2 to the 10th one. Okay. So I'm not sure it's right, but if it's not right, at least you got some random generator. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I was thinking, okay, it's great. Now I can do some timings. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to execute something like that. So it's not supporting. Okay. Oh. Yeah. No, it is. So yeah, I think there's some double free at some point, but it's not really clear why. Because if you look at mathematics code, um, looks like that. So you've got a, a lot of templating which is hidden inside micros and then you have really nice thing like that and you don't really know anymore what it does. Yeah. And in Cypher you cannot implement such things so you have to cheat and it looks something like First, you have to define everything, which is really boring because I don't want to type all those things if I'm not really using them. And then you have to do some tricks, so like C type def, because you want two different implementations. So one using the with the naive implementation and one using the attempted pretty fast relaxed implementation. And then you have to copy paste everything twice to to get both, whether in uh, whereas in C++, it's, it's <coughs> just some templating and specialization. And you have also have to use that trick that uh, Fokker showed you yesterday. And so you define something, but in fact you tell Cyton, okay, so I'll call it this way, but in the C++ file, I want you to put that horrible thing for the name of the function. Because that is some templated functions and Python doesn't understand it by itself. And in fact, I think that Volker, you told us yesterday that you have to, you can define operators with Cyton. It's easy to work. So if I write A plus B in my Cyton file, it will call the plus from C++. Yes, no, the, you can't. It doesn't work with equal equal? Yes. Oh, strange. But most operators, most C++ mm -hmm. operators work. Okay. Okay. It's for MMX. So you also have PLX in PowerGP. So I guess everybody knows what PowerGP is. <coughs> it's made mostly maintained by uh, two guys in Bordeaux. Uh, it's a C library for number theory computation. Um, they currently offer two branches one which is a stable one, 2.5. something, and a development one. Uh, I'm not completely aware of the status of the development one. Because I was speaking with Andreas Engel, which told me, yeah, yeah, it's published, but it doesn't seem to be officially published yet. We got some alpha in the name of the tarball, so I don't know. So it's been used by Sage uh, forever, uh, and we are currently shipping the shipping the 2.5 version. So maybe we, sh I don't know. There's some nice thing in the 2.6, so it could be good to to switch. So you have some PLX type in uh, in PowerGP, which is uh, implemented kind of like in Sage and, and Clean. So you have a multi-precision integer for the unit part, some um, integers for the valuation of the precision, and yeah, some additional data. You you have some pointers to to corners of P. I guess you you have a pointer to P to the. Uh, Precision minus evaluation or, or something like that. So you have all the usual basic functionalities. Um, so addition, multiplication, square root, and so on. You also have some machinery to, to do answer lifting uh, over the PADX and over uh, unramified extensions. And I think it's only in 2.6 that you have really fast point counting on elliptic curves in small characteristics using uh, algorithm Alasato. 
and yeah, you can also do it because of JX numbers, things like that. So some benchmarks. So for these benchmarks, uh, I use my my laptop, which is uh, quite recent. Uh, some recent version of Magma. Um, yeah, it's not really fair because Magma recently released some versions compiled with AVX support, uh, and I didn't use that. I think it was from something like 2.19 more than 2. I didn't have the, the latest version. Uh, or the i7 2019. This one? Yeah. Oh, no, it's from this year. No, I didn't get your question. No, that i7-2620, that doesn't have AVX. Uh, I don't remember. I don't think so, anyway. Mm -hmm. Yes, it has. Alright, thanks. Um, <coughs> Yeah, also tried Flynn, very GP. So I wanted to try Mathematics, but it, it's a cross system. So yeah, for Prairie GP, the timings were done through the GP interpreter, which is surely a small overhead, but not that bad. So I, I didn't want to take random numbers, so I just rolled dice and showed both of this one, which in fact I stole from Sebastian Pankrat's presentation. So hopefully that will be random. And yeah. Something so as you could guess, yeah. So Flint is quite fast, but it's a C library, so it, it had to be expected. Uh, here, both scales are logarithmic, so for the time, it's kind of yeah, you could divide it. But the i is not the precision, the precision is in fact 2 to the i, so it's logarithmic in the precision and linear in i. So this was kind of strange because Sage, which, which is kind of doing the same thing as Flint, was faster than Flint uh, at some point. But as I said earlier, it's because Sage is cheating with the implementation I used to do the benchmarks, which is a cut relative one. So it doesn't do the modular reduction in the end. In fact, it tries to do it before, but uh, inputs were already reduced already reduced. So it's missing one modular reduction, which explains why it's getting beneath stage of very GP and clean. Okay. So we see that. Mm, but if you are of the time, print is the fastest one and very GP is the good as well. So I think there's a trick here. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the the curve for Sage is quite strange. So I had a look at the source code, and what happens is that Sage just takes your periodic elements, converts it to Pauli, and then calls the Pauli function. So I think from 10 and above, it's just going on the same curves as Pauli GP. Because you have some big overhead in the beginning, and then it's kind of negligible. Probably the Pari interface, not the library. No, it's or through the library interface. It's calling the C function on, on the C object. I think so, no? Well, it's isn't it like 10 milliseconds? There's a 10 millisecond delay that's not. Mm -hmm. You can't really do that in C by converting something. Okay. Yeah, it's possible. I, I, yeah, I think you're right. It's calling something like Pari parentheses of the element. So does that go through the interpreter? Convert it to decimal, it sends it to the University of Washington, converts it there. It's really cheating doing that. <laughs> that was faster. <laughs> <laughs> Send in a patch. Yeah, so you can see. Well, 
stage is really not that bad for KDF numbers. So it's kind of always faster than magma and yeah, a little bit slower than Perry and much slower than Flint. Uh, here as well for exponential and the logarithm. So you have something like a factor of 10 or maybe 80, something like that, between uh, the C library Flint and in stage and magma. Then I, I did the same for QLX numbers, uh, I mean unramified extension, and then it, Sage is getting kind of not so good. But it was to be expected because um, the implementation in Sage are currently really naive. Well, it was not done to be fast, so you can say it's okay. So here you have something like that. Uh, what, why no hurry? Oh, because you don't have this by default. I, I think you have to implement that if you want that. Okay. You, you just have that for PIDs, I think. You, you don't have any type for the PIDs. You have some machine way to do the answer listing, but it just takes a polynomial, something with the PIDs, I guess, and twist it oh, in a finite field. Yeah, so for the logarithm, we have a, a factor of 100 or something like that. So, yeah. so the problem is it's really bad. It's maybe 10,000 slower, even more. Because that one doesn't really make any sense. I want to understand. Um, yeah. So now just, yeah, I'm really late. So, so, <coughs> so as I said, and it was wrong. You don't have only one precision for every periodic object, but you have only one way to use precision. And another limitation is that when you have some inexact elements, in fact, you cannot really split the way the precision is handled and the approximation which is used to represent it. So that's what um, David Wu and And Xavier Caruso has been working on for a couple of years at least. Um, I don't remember which branch it is. You can do the break now and the little demo after a while. It won't be long, but it has some time, so maybe 13 seconds in the back. So if someone wants to fix all this horrible stuff, it's because of MTZ, because you. I don't know if it's Cyton, I think it's Cyton which gets confused because you don't. Really initialize your MPZ in a usual way, and yeah, so it's not happy with that. If you want to play with uh, the precision code, it's available on, on that set of uh, website. Uh, it's not the latest version, but you could ask Isaac uh, also if his lat latest code. And you also have to, to apply some patch before, which took me some hours yesterday because I didn't know about that. So you have to use. Um, the patch on track ticket 6, uh, 66, 67, so 6,667, which is something about Newton polygons, which recently went uh, into Sage, uh, thanks to Xavier and Falker's effort, I guess. 
but there was some limitation with the strokes uh, on the end of the polygon. Okay, so basically you can do just the same thing as before, uh, but now you also have lazy periodics, so I can say that x is 0 in my field, okay, but now it knows that x is exact, so it's really the 0, it's not 0 up to some precision. Of course I can also have exact elements, so create it uh, as you have to precise the precision now when you create it. Um, it's not exact anymore. Uh, another possibility is to add some big O to your element, so you create it in a, an exact way and say, okay, I just want it uh, up to precision 50. And you can add all of these together. So when you have something exact and something inexact, it gets inexact, as you would expect. You can multiply them. So now it knows it's multiplying something by zero. So smart enough to divide this to zero. But here it's you are adding uh, an inexact zero to x, so um, something strange. Uh, what was x? Yeah. So uh, you are adding uh, an exact zero and an inexact zero, so you get something inexact. Um, yes, you have logarithm, exponential, special, and so on. So as I said, now you, you also have an implementation for lazy PLX in stage. So I can create um, an exact element uh, which is equal to 6 and compute its logarithm. So it's lazy, so it doesn't compute anything because it would need a, an infinite um, uh, amount of computation to devise what this is worth, so it's not evaluated. Uh, but if I add some precision bound, it will evaluate. So no, okay, I I told it. Oops. Yes, go to precision p to the twenty, so it computed the logarithm up to precision two to the twenty. So this method doesn't modify the elements, so why is that change? It's the same thing as multiplying by some inexact elements, which corresponds to the inexact things. So you have more complicated stuff, which remain lazy. Uh, you don't have automatic simplification as with symbolic expressions uh, yet, but you can still evaluate it. You can check that it's really expected as well. Uh, there's some limitation right now. Uh, I mean, you cannot really avoid that, but um, in this case, I think it could divide that z is zero, but it doesn't because it's just computing more and more coefficients and doing the subtraction and doesn't get that it is zero, so I have to kill it. But if I told it to, okay, just go up to precision 1000, it would say, okay, uh, this is indeed zero. So you can also define polynomials as before, um, in an exact or inexact way. And yeah, you can play with uh, Newton polygons. Uh, I'm going fast about that. So basically you get, uh, corresponds to the precision of your coefficients. You can do the same thing with the matrices. So you can first make them exact or use some inexact coefficients with different valuation for each coefficient, uh, different precision for each coefficient. 
And when you do the product, is it controls the cohesion in a smart way, so it's not something global for the matrix, but it's independent for each coefficient, so depending on the way it was computed. You also have uh, matrix matrices over lazy p addicts. So I think that you spent a lot of, of, of time to be able to get that nice printing set. And you can break everything when you uh, give it some bonding precision. So as I s might have mentioned, uh, now you have really separate objects for the approximations and the precision. So in fact, you can really <coughs> play with both of them independently. So when you create some inexact elements in the TLX number, you can retrieve the approximation, which I guess you could also do before. So it is yeah, the approximation of the PX numbers. But you can also retrieve the precision, so the decor, and play with that. You can, uh, I guess, add uh, approximation, which is not so exceptional. You can also add precision, which happens in the spaces of uh, big O things. You can modify the precision easily. You can check that one precision is uh, better than the other one, etc including the other one, whether it's exact, which is not the case for the bigger stuff. So the approximation is not always working when you're playing with exact elements, you don't have any approximations, but you can tell safe to, okay, give me the approximation up to precision 50. Um, and so on, and you, you can do kind of the same thing with polynomials, except that for polynomials, you have a bunch of models for precision. So by default, no, the precision is not uh, a tuple of precision for each coefficient, but you got um, some Newton polygon. So in this case, uh, what you can see, where it is? A, A, B. Um, okay. So I told you to create that polynomial, but because that precision is within the convex file of the Newton polygon, it gets automatically uh, lowered down to O to the 5 to the 13. So this is a default way to deal with precision, but you can use other models for precision, and you can even add elements using different precision models. And there is some automatic correction uh, between them. So I think here we added something using the Newton polygons and something using something else, which I don't remember what it is. Jack default. Okay. And you can add them. And in fact, yeah, you have some nice graph showing you the relation between the, the different uh, models. So when you had something and here it gets coerced into the Newton polygon implementation. I guess it would be for And then yeah, you have a, a lot of bunch of things to create context for the precision models and so on. But I won't be speaking about that because I, I don't even know which way. happy to have questions during the talk and this will both be interactive and I think we have found so. Um, should we yes. I just have a, a, a sort of research question which you don't have to answer if you don't have any idea because I have no idea. Um, the complexity of computing logarithms and exponentials mm -hmm. in QP or in ZP or whatever um, because I've, I've wondered about this for a long time if, if you're looking just at power series over a ring mm -hmm. And if m of n is your multiplication complexity, then you can do exponentials and logarithms in O of m of n time. The real numbers, you lose a factor of log n. But for p-addicts, the best algorithms I know, you lose a factor of log n squared. And I'm wondering if anyone knows how to do better than that. I have no idea. Okay. 
Paljon ei ole. Tämä on niin kuin tuossa katsoa lapsisiin. If not, then I think we'll have a coffee break now and then we'll be back here and decide what to do. Yeah. Uh, in half an hour? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs>